Carl, so what president could you take and apply? Uh, here we go. Well, after he had a stroke. Uh, but, <laughs> pretty bad. Uh, this is a lecture for my eighth hour class on 412. All right. So, so um, anyway, um, when the Russia entered this war, I mean, they should have, no, no nation should have, but Russia had the most to lose. And a perfect example of what happened to Russia is the Battle of Tannenberg, which occurred over on the Eastern Front. And so many Russians got killed that the German gunners had to stop in the middle of the battle and go out in front and kick down piles of dead bodies. Now, in other words, the, you're here with a machine gun and the bodies are piling up this high and you don't have a clear line of fire anymore. So you got to go kick them down so you can kill more Russians. And the Russians just kept coming and coming and 300,000 of them died the day. Uh, and seven, six or 700,000 were wounded. That's the way the war went. So get this down. By 1916, uh, the war was going very, very badly. Uh, and there were several groups of people in Russia, all right? Listen, there were several groups of people in Russia who had long been wanting to get rid of the czar. They didn't like the czar. Uh, they had, tried, you know, anarchists and communists and socialists. And another group, have we written down Bolsheviks? Okay, we'll write them down. Uh, Bolsheviks. And, that, and by the way, uh, just to simplify everything, uh, at first, there was a difference between the Bolsheviks and the communists. Eventually, they're all communists. So if, you, if somebody today says Bolshevik, they're talking about communists, okay? So all these groups, socialists, anarchists, uh, Bolsheviks, communists, they had been operating underground <coughs> for many, many years wanting to overthrow the Tsar. And actually, uh, the Tsar's grandfather, Nicholas II's grandfather, <coughs> was actually assassinated by one of these groups, okay? So they actually killed czars. And, of course, the czars had a secret police, and the secret police, they were constantly engaged trying to dig out these people that were trying to overthrow the government. And uh, so um, um, these groups, get this down, though. They were still there, though, uh, despite the efforts of the secret police. And these groups... When the war came and, and Russia started to fail in the war, they saw this as a great opportunity to finally overthrow the government. This is what I'm saying. These groups that had long been trying to overthrow the Tsar, when the war starts going bad, they say, aha, here's our chance. The Russian people will soon tire from the war. They'll tire from the war. And uh, this is our chance to rally the Russian people to help us overthrow the Tsar. Okay, so there were all of these groups in Russia. Well, the winter of 19, get this down, the winter of 1916, 1917, in addition to everything else that was going wrong, was one of the worst in history. When I talk about a bad Russian winter, I'm talking about 60 or 70 degrees below zero. People were freezing to death. Uh, plus communications broke down. Plus uh, transportation broke down. They couldn't get food from the countryside into the big cities. And by the way, get this down, the Russian revolution is going to start in the big cities. It's not going to be out on the, in the countryside. It's going to start in the big cities. So millions of, there's a food shortage. People are starving. Millions of people are dying in this unpopular war. And in St. Petersburg, get this down, St. Petersburg was the capital city of Russia. In St. Petersburg, hungry people start, uh, hungry people start marching, demanding relief from the government, people that are starving. By the way, get this down, hunger has been the catalyst for many, there's the word catalyst, cause, hunger has been the catalyst for most revolutions. The French Revolution, you know, the, the French people lived under the Bourbon kings for centuries until they got hungry. When they said starved enough, they rose up, they overthrew the king. Fat Louis chopped his head off and they killed his wife as well. And the French Revolution began. This revolution we're talking about, the Russian Revolution, it starts with hunger. By the way, which revolution didn't start? Which which revolution for, with, with because of hunger? Which revolution was led by a bunch of uh, you know fat, well-fed, happy people? Industrial. No. American, American Revolution. American Revolution. Yeah, we weren't starving. America was a pretty prosperous place. Uh, no, that's not why the revolution, the American Revolution, was fought. And the American Revolution, by the way, stands out on its own. Okay, it's an exceptional event. It's very different from these that we're talking about uh, today. And I'll 
develop that further later on. But anyway, people are pro get this down. People by 1916, 1917, the winter of 1916, people are protesting, stop the war. And of course, <clears throat> you know, uh, some of the Russian nobles, the nobility, the upper class, uh, they went to the Tsarina and they said to her, you know, and by the way, they had warehouses of food for the army. And those Russian nobles said, you need to open up those warehouses and let the people have them. Because if you don't, if the people continue to starve, it'll finally get so bad that they will rise up and they'll kill all of us. All of us people up here at the top, you, and the czar, and all of us nobles, they'll kill us. So open up the the uh, food warehouses. And she thought, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe. So who did she go to for advice? Rasputin. And Rasputin told her this. Don't, look, don't give those people food. There's a thousand out there today. You give them food. Guess what? Tomorrow there's going to be 5,000. And if you give them food, the next day there's going to be 25,000. And the next thing you know, you're going to have a revolution on your hands. You give these people an inch and they'll take them off. Well, Rasputin, what should I do? What do you suggest? Shoot them. Send out the army and shoot them. Send out the Cossacks. There was this Russian cavalry. They were called the Cossacks. They wear big fur hats. And across the saddles of their horses, hanging on their saddle horns, they had this knotted rope, long knotted rope that long. And in that rope, they had pieces of jagged metal and glass. And when the czar would send them out against the people, they would ride among them and trample them with their horses and then whipping the others. And they could hit you across that and slash your neck open. Uh, with that. Send out the Cossacks, send out the army. Whose advice did uh, uh, the Tsarina follow? Rasputin. Rasputin. Just got this down. It sends out the army. Let me tell you something. If you're... I read these senior profiles once in a while. They say, you know, what do you want to do? Or what are your goals? Well, I want to get a good job. I want to get a college degree and get a good job and make a lot of money. And marry a supermodel. Let me tell you something, Joe. Joe there ain't that many supermodels in the world. So they're, they're very, very limited. But that seems like every senior boy wants to marry a supermodel. Well, anyway. Anyway. Um, lost my train of thought. Um, what was I about to say? If your goal in life is to be a dictator of a small country, let me give you a little advice. You just want to get a little country and you want to rule over it. If there's ever a protest, don't shoot the people. Because if you start shooting people, if there are 500 today and you shoot 50 of them, how many will there be tomorrow? 1,000. And if you shoot some of them, there will be 10,000. And the next thing you know, your head will be on a stick. The people will rise up. So don't do that. But that's what Rasputin told her to do. In fact, he actually said this. He said, the, he said, he said be hard on them. He said, the Russian people... Love the feel of the whip. That's what he told her. They love the feel of the whip. So she sent them out. And guess what? The protest grew. And guess what? By uh, December of 1916, get this down, Russia was on the brink of a revolution. And these nobles, get this down, these nobles go to the Tsarina. <clears throat> People like this guy. You don't have to write him down, but Felix Yusupov. Uh, he married the Tsar's niece, Princess Irina. She was considered to be the most beautiful woman in Russia at the time. And he married her, and that got him in the royal family. And he's looking at this situation growing out in the streets, and he said, if we don't do something to help these people, our heads are going to be on a stick. They're going to rise up and kill us. So he went to the Tsarina and said, you've got to feed the people. And she essentially said, Rasputin, my advisor, is advising me otherwise, and I'm going to continue the policy. And so Felix Yusupov here decides, you know, there's no way that we can convince the Tsarina to feed the people and maybe avoid this revolution unless what? Who's standing in our way to persuade Rasputin. him? Rasputin. So what do we got to do? Kill him. We got to kill him. So guess what? He hatches a murder plot. Get this down. He hatches a murder plot. By the way, there's his house. It's still there. Had 1,500 rooms. How much was it? Huh? Oh, I don't know. But see that door? That's the main entrance. When you walk in, that's the stair. That's the foyer. That's the stairway. It's great bathrooms they have. Huh? It's great bathrooms. I don't know. Is there a risk like this? Huh? Who's asking that? That's Usopov's house. That's the house Rasputin is killed in. How big was Rasputin's house? 
Oh, he lived in the Royal Palace. I mean, it was huge too, several hundred rooms like that. So, you know, if you got your phone, you can take a picture of that and go and tell your parents tonight you'd like your bedroom remodeled like that this summer. But uh, anyway. I want Rasputin in my bedroom. There. Yeah, anyway, you have to dig him up. Anyway, there, there's, there is uh, the house, you know. I mean, it just shows you the opulence and, and uh, the luxury in which these Russian nobles, while the peasants are out there starving, that's how they're living, okay? So he invites Rasputin to his house for a party. Well, believe it or not, Rasputin wasn't a big party animal. He didn't like being around people that much. And when uh, Yusupov said, "Well, we're going to have a little, we're going to have a party. It's going to be a grand uh, ball. It's going to be a grand event. We want you." And Rasputin said, "No, I don't want to come to." And he said, "Well, you know," he said, "I understand. You know, I understand that you, you know, don't like big crowds and things. So guess what? I've got this basement. That's not the kind of basement that you and I are used to. It's." Uh, you know, where there are canned green beans and spider webs, and that's where you go with the tornado sour. Close. This place was what? It's an ant season. Yeah, well, anyway, the, uh, this place was a luxurious apartment. Somebody first hour said it was his man cave, okay? It had a bearskin, white bearskin rug. It had a carved uh, fireplace. Uh, it had a huge chandelier. It had overstuffed furniture. It was a beautiful, beautiful room. And that's where he sort of went to escape things. And so he said to Rasputin, you don't have to come to the party. Just come, come to the back entrance. I'll let you in. And you can just sit down there and relax. And Rasputin said, I still don't want to come. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If you'll come, uh, once my wife and I uh, greet our other guests, I'll send my wife down to you. And you can have some alone time with her. And what did Rasputin say? Oh, her name's like what time do, do I need to be there? Okay, so Rasputin's going to show up. Meanwhile, this guy who's going to murder Rasputin, uh, he makes he has all the servants. He he has he clears the house of all the servants, all of them. In fact, on the day of the uh, on the night of the party, there are only three people in that entire house. It's him, uh, his doctor, and uh, one of his friends, and they had prepared some little cakes, little spice cakes or something. Uh, and the doctor had taken a, a syringe and he had injected it with cyanide, okay? Uh, you know, cyanide comes in two forms, liquid and gas. If this were gas, cyanide, I could just do that and kill every one of us in this room. That's how strong it is. So they had injected it, and then they got a wine decanter uh, and filled it up about it with wine, but he poured several cups or a lot, I don't know, several cups, but a lot, a lot of, it didn't take much, a lot of cyanide in there. And they set it down there on the table, lit a fire, and the place is all ready. And Rasputin shows up. I think it was December 16th, 1916. And that's not important, but Rasputin shows up. And, you know, he sits on the couch, and Usopov is there and says, Well, you know, try, how don't you have a cake, piece of cake? Oh, well, I think it will. Took, took a bite, and he just munching away. And, of course, Usopov just expects him to, Collapse dead, just drop dead, and he eats one cake, and then he eats. Oh, I have some wine. Well, he drinks some wine, you know, but no visible effect. And you saw him sitting there looking, you know, and I guess beads of perspiration are breaking out on his head. And he says, "Excuse me, I've got to go attend to my other guests, but I'll be right back." And he goes up the stairs. I'm sure he grabbed that doctor by the lapel and said, "I thought you said, I thought you said that you put enough cyanide in there to kill a bull elephant." He's down there eating. Cake and drinking wine with no visible effect. The doctor said, well, gee, I don't know what the problem is. Well, Usopov said, we'll go to plan B. And plan B was my pistol. And he goes back down. When he goes, when he gets back down in there, Rasputin is standing in front of that fireplace, warming his hands like this. And uh, Usopov is coming down the stairway, like over against that wall over there. And he comes down and he stands there and he just yells, Grigory Rasputin! Say your prayers. And Rasputin goes, huh? bam, bam, shot him twice. And he falls out on the bare skin rug. Yes. Where did the bullet hit him? I don't know. In the back. Shot him in the, but shot him in the back. And he falls down. And Usopov looks at him and says, I've got to get some help. This is the guy. is a long, tall guy. That's a narrow stairway. We've got to get him out of the house. So he goes upstairs. And he tells the doctor and his friend, come on down and help me. And they're coming down the stairs. And when they uh, get to the bottom of the stairs, Rasputin is up on his all fours and he's just breathing mm, mm, like a wounded animal and they're shocked. Uh, and Rasputin lets out a roar and goes scrambling toward them and they turn around and run. And by the way, Rasputin has been poisoned and shot. Uh, there are three of them. There's one of him and they've got a gun and they run. 
and they're running through the palace uh, with Rasputin staggering after them. Uh, and he gets to the front door, and you know, it's a very cold, bitter winter night. He gets to the front door, and they shout to him, or he shouts to them, I will tell the Tsarina everything. Uh-oh. I'll tell you. And uh, they come back, and by this time, Rasputin is staggering out in the yard, and they um, go out of the yard, and bam, bam, shoot him two more times. He falls down. They drag him in. They wrap him in a curtain, tie his hands up. And just for good measure, there was a heavy brass lamp, and they bash the front of his head in with that. And then they take him out to the Neva River. It's December. It's cold. The river's frozen solid. And they chop a hole in the ice and stuff him in there and go home. Three days later, there's a guy ice fishing down the river. Just kind of, oh, I've got something. What is it? A car? Ah, it's Rasputin. <laughs> okay. and killed so, so they pull him. No, they pull him. And of course, they're all. I'm giving you the version. I'm giving you the version that Usopov gave. He's one of the killers. This is the But this has been contested many times. Some people say that they just came up behind him with a pistol and shot him in the back of the head. That's. Far less dramatic. It's not as interesting a story. Um, but then, then there are stories that when they did the autopsy on it, when they pulled him out of the, they did stuff him in the river. When they pulled him out of the river, um, they said his lungs were full of water. What would that have meant? Yeah. That after being shot four times, poisoned, and had his skull bashed in, when they stuffed him in the river, he was still alive. Uh, another one said his hands were untied. Okay, so he might have been alive when they stuffed him in the river. But anyway, he wasn't anymore. Uh, Rasputin, Rasputin was dead. You know, he had written a letter to the Tsarina uh, about a month before this. This is in December of 1916. He had written a letter to the Tsarina and he had said, let me get him back up here. He had written a letter. This is much better. Uh, he had, that's his best side. <laughs> anyway, he had written a letter, he had written a letter to the Tsarina and said, you know, I feel like I'm going to die very soon much longer for the world. And he said, if if ordinary if, if, if ordinary people, you know, if I mean, I'm just walking down the street and some robber tries to rob me and, I want, and he shoots me, just ordinary, he said, you and your family have nothing to fear. But if a member of your family kills me, he said, you and your family, your entire family will be dead within two years. Well, a member of the royal family did kill him. And within two years, guess what? The whole royal family was dead. So what does that tell you about Rasputin? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's a, it's a, it's he controls fate. Uh, what? He controls fate. That's what. No, I'm he didn't. <laughs> That's my point. That's my Magic. point. He didn't. Okay. So Rasputin was dead. All right. Get this down. Rasputin was dead. And by the way, they wrote a disco song about him in the 1970s. You know. Uh, no. Well, I did one time for a class. Uh, we've got a little time after the test. Remind me, and I'll look that up. But uh, I'll give you a, a line from it. I, I keep telling you that the 1970s was the worst decade in human history. And if you don't believe that, just go listen to some disco music. You know, it'll make you jump off a bridge. I listened to 10 years of that crap. But anyway, um, the song—I don't know the name of it—but the song here's here's the one verse from it. They put some poison in his, talking about Rasputin, they put some poison in his wine. He drank it all and said, gee, I feel just fine. People were, end quote, people were dancing to that kind of nonsense in the 70s. Aren't you glad you missed it? Anyway, well, so get this down. Uh, Rasputin is dead uh, and, and all is turmoil. Okay, get this down. There's a lot of chaos in Russia. There are protests in the streets. People are starving. Communications are broken down. Transportation is broken down. And observing all of this, get this down, observing all of this are the Germans. Look here. The Germans are watching that. Uh, and the Germans, the Germans, uh, you know, know, by the way, by 1917, the Germans knew that the Americans were on the way. The United States had declared war. And, and the Germans want to win the war. They want to defeat England, England and France before the Americans show up. Uh, and so uh, they had to, to come up with a plan to take Russia out the war. Uh, because, listen, get this down. They believe, the Germans believe at this point, they're, they're looking at all this chaos and trouble in Russia. The Germans believe, look, if we can start a revolution, get this down, if we can start a revolution in Russia, 
that will take Russia out of the war. And look at this. This was the Eastern Front, and the Russians, uh, the Germans, excuse me, for four years have had two million men over here. Well, two, two million men over here on the Eastern Front. If Russia drops out of the war, if Russia is no longer fighting Germany, they said, we can take these two million men and rush them. What is this? The Western Front. We can rush. <laughs> we can rush them to the Western Front and achieve a breakthrough <coughs> and defeat France and England before the Americans show up. By the time the Americans get here, the war will be over. That was their plan. But we've got to take Russia out of the war. You understand what they're talking about here? Yes? So they said, we've got to find someone to start a revolution. It's there, you know, they, Russia was at the point tipping point for of a revolution. But we've got to find somebody to push them over the edge. Well, they found someone right here in Switzerland. Get that down. Right there in Switzerland. And here's who they found. This man, Nikolai Lenin. His name was Vladimir Ilyich. But everybody just, you don't, you don't have to write Nikolai, just Lenin. That's, how, that's his pen name. He wrote a lot. And when he wrote, he didn't use his real name to sign his articles. Usually, he signed it Lenin. Yes. You related to Vladimir Putin? Hmm. You related to Vladimir Putin? No, he's not. But same name. Yeah, same name. But uh, yeah, his name was Vladimir Ilyich, and uh, he's known as Lenin. Uh, I don't know if there's a devil, but if there is, I think he looks just like that. Uh, get this down. This is the man that led the Russian Revolution. This is the man that led the Russian Revolution. He's a thug. He's a murderer. He is a terrorist. He killed millions of people. The system he put in place killed millions of people. If there is a hell, he's in the bottom rung of it. I cannot, I can only say one thing good about Lenin. He liked cats. But other than that, there's nothing good to say about him. He liked cats. So guess what they do? Get this down. Of course there was a cat person who did all this. Uh, huh? So of course there was somebody who likes cats who did all this. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, I'm just grasping for something. You don't want to say someone's totally bad, but he's totally bad. Anyway, the, the Germans, look, go to Switzerland, and they get Lenin, and they put him on a train, and they take him right up here to the Russian frontier. That train, that train, they had. They, it was a sealed train. They had pulled the curtains on the train, uh, and they get up. They get up to the Russian border here. They get up to the Russian border. Get up to the Russian border, and they stop the train. And a group of German soldiers unhook that one car, and they just push it into Russia, and they walk away. It was almost like they had unleashed the the plague bacillus on Russia, and they had. It was like infecting the whole country with a deadly disease, and he will get out of his train car. He'll get out of his train car, and he will make it all the way to St. Petersburg, get this down, and he's going to start that revolution. He's going to start that revolution. He starts making speeches in the streets. Get this down. Here's a picture later that the Communist Party painted. It's a propaganda picture. Shows him like a Patrick Henry figure up there speaking out to the Russian people. Look, there's a peasant woman. There's a wounded soldier. There's a sailor. And they're all cheering Lenin. And here's what he told them. Get this down. If you follow me, if you follow the Bolsheviks, the communists, if you follow me, he said, and this, this becomes the slogan of the Russian Revolution. By the way, what is the slogan of the American Revolution? I've tried to teach you that since August. Me a what? No. That was said. You, huh? What did you say? No, that's, that's the first three words of the Constitution. This is long before the, the Constitution... Constitution in, in written until 1787. This is in 1775. What's 1776, in fact? 
No, that was said in the years leading up to that. What? All men are created, All men are created equal. That's our national, you know, that was the 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 the, the national that was our national our slogan in the uh, Revolutionary War. All men are created. That's in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We fought the war based on that idea. And I've told you many times that ideas are powerful things. That idea launched a revolution. Well, here was Lenin's slogan for the Russian Revolution. Land, peace, and bread. Land, peace, and bread. You peasants who have worked for centuries on the lands of these big nobles, you've worked and worked and worked and you'll never own that land. If we overthrow, if you follow me and we get rid of the czar, I will be in charge of Russia and I will t give you land. You won't just work on that land. It will, you will have land. I will take us out of World War I. Peace. We'll get out of this awful war and I'll give you something to eat. And the Russian people responded to that. Get this down. Land, peace, and bread. And he preached, he begins to preach that in the streets of St. Petersburg. And in October of 1917, get this down, October of 1917, a group of Russian sailors on a Russian ship called the Aurora. You don't have to write down the Aurora, but a group of Russian sailors. <clears throat> That's why when... The Soviet Union existed. Parents used to dress their little children in sailors' uniforms because sailors started, sparked the revolution. Uh, a group of sailors on board a Russian ship called the Aurora killed the captain and the officers of the ship, and they took over the ship, and they sailed it right into St. Petersburg. You know, we talked about the Neva River where they stuffed Rasputin. Well, they sailed it right up the Neva River into St. Petersburg, and they fired on the Winter Palace. In the winter, this was in the fall, but in the Winter Palace, there was the Tsarina and her four daughters. Okay. And the mobs stormed the palace, got this down, and they and she was taken prisoner. The Tsar, get this down. The Tsarina and her four daughters were taken prisoner. And that was in St. Petersburg. Hundreds of miles away, the Tsar and his son, the Tsarovich, were down here on the front lines, and the war was collapsing. And a group of Russian soldiers killed their officers. They mutinied too. They killed their officers and they took the Tsar prisoner and his son. Uh, and they forced him, get this down. They, for, they forced the Tsar to abdicate. Write that down. They forced the Tsar to abdicate. That means give up power. He had to sign a document saying that he was no longer Tsar and the Russian monarchy was ended. And then they put him on a train and they ship him back to St. Petersburg, and he and his whole family are held prisoner by the communists. <clears throat> Meanwhile, get this down, a civil war will break out in Russia when this happens. A civil war will break out. There were a lot of people who supported the Tsar. There were people who supported the communists. In this civil war that breaks out, just keep right on writing. Now we move from 1916 to 1917. The Civil War breaks out between the white Russians, and that has nothing to do with race. All of these Russians were white. The white Russians, the reason they were called the white Russians is that they wore a white armband on their arm so uh, they could dis be distinguished as white fighting in the white Russian army. Get this down. And the white Russians, they supported the Tsar. They wanted to rescue the Tsar from the communists. Get that down. They wanted to rescue the Tsar from the communists and reestablish the monarchy. They were fighting against the communists. Who? The communists, what was their color? Red. red. Okay, so you've got the white Russians versus the red Russians. The communists. And of course, they are fighting to destroy the Tsar. And the Tsar is being held captive. And uh, the Russians, the, the, the red Russians, you know, are constantly having to move the czar from place to place, little village, little town from place to place, because the white Russians are trying to rescue him. Several times the white Russians came within a hair of rescuing the czar, uh, but the 
Red Russians managed to get him out uh, before the White Russians could rescue him. So there's a civil war going on here in Russia. Well, again, the Germans had started all of this, in a sense. They had started all of this, and they're watching this develop. Listen, get this down. So Lenin knows this. Here he is in this civil war. Lenin knew that he could never rule Russia until he won this civil war, until he defeated the white Russians. And he also knew that he would never be able to defeat the white Russians, now listen to what I'm saying, as long as Russia was involved in this war against Germany. You got that? He, he wants, he, he knows he has to defeat. Everybody get up. Everybody stand up and stretch quickly. All right, have a seat real quick. He knew, Lenin knew, he's in the middle of this civil war now. He knew that he would never control Russia <coughs> until he defeated the white Russians. And he knew he could never defeat the white Russians as long as he had to fight the Germans too. So get this down. Uh, Lenin, he didn't personally do it. <coughs> but Lenin's aides will meet with the Russians at a Polish village called Brest the Tops. And you're, you're sophomores in high school, you ought to be able to spell Brest Litovsk. It's a new word. On every time you encounter something new, say, I can't. You'll never get anywhere. That's easy to spell. Brest, B R E S T. Litovsk. That was the name of the little village. And the treaty that was signed there became known uh, between Russia, got this down, between Russia and Germany. The treaty that was signed there between Russia and Germany is the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And that took Russia out of the war. Get that down. That took So had Germany's plan worked? Yes. It had. That took Russia out of the war. And now, just keep right on writing, since the, look at this, since the Germans no longer have to fight the Russians because they're out, they take those two million men and they rush them across Germany to the Western Front and get this down in the summer of 1918. The Germans broke through the Allied lines. I told you earlier, no, neither side ever achieved a breakthrough. Well, that's almost true. But in the summer of 1918, the Germans achieved a temporary breakthrough. And look, it looked like they were going to win the war. They're marching toward Paris. What stopped them? The U.S. The United States arrived. Two million Americans with more on the way. That's in the summer of 1918. The war ends. That, that's in July of 19. The, the war ends in November of 1918. We're not there very long, but we play a critical role. Millions of Americans pour into France and stop this German offensive. And the war ends right there, but we'll get back to that later. Meanwhile, in Russia, I got this down. Lenin came to the conclusion that he would never be able to defeat the white Russians and control Russia <clears throat> as long as the Tsar and his family were alive. So Lenin ordered the Tsar to be killed. And when those orders came down to the right, yes. Were there any uh, living czars there? Were there any the czars relatives left? Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, we'll take it up there come tomorrow.